Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Father, we just thank you that you are a miracle-working God. That, Lord, that it is part of our inheritance. It's part of what you paid for on the cross. Lord, tonight as we come together, we pray that miracles would flow and that your people would receive everything that they need, that their heart desires, that they are, uh, that they are, are uh, supplicating and, and petitioning you for. Father, we pray that miracles would be present and delivered tonight. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence in this place. We thank you that you are a good God, a good Father, a healer, a miracle worker, and we give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. God bless you. Well, this is Miracle Night at the Life Center, and um, we're excited because we know that it's not just in our hearts to see miracles come forth, but it is on the heart of the Father, and the Holy Spirit desires to show and to demonstrate that Jesus is alive. Amen. And when we come together with an expectancy, with a desire, with, with needs, and with that, uh, that hunger, God is not going to disappoint. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we try to do some teaching on these nights or bring some revelation as it relates to the area of miracles. And, you know, the word is so full of scripture as it relates to the miraculous. Uh, one of the, certainly one of the well-known scriptures is John 14, 12, where Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works I do, he will do uh, also, and greater works will these, than these will he do because I go to the Father. And so that is part of our inheritance as believers, as saints of the Most High God, as children of God. We have the ability, we have the mandate, we have the anointing and the grace to walk in miracles. And God desires to demonstrate his faithfulness, his healing power, uh, his miracle working power, and his sovereignty through us as we extend our faith for our brothers and sisters and for those who don't know him, for miracles to be made manifest. Luke 18, 27, Jesus said, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. The things that are impossible with men are possible with God because there is a superseding of natural laws by the power of God. You see, when we come and we extend our faith to a supernatural God, all natural things have to bow to the supernatural God that created all natural things. And we can, we can come into alignment with that, come into an agreement with that, and we will see miracles begin to flow. Matthew 19, 26, with man this is impossible, but with God nothing shall be impossible. Nothing. You know, we can't even wrap our mind around that, that no thing, nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing. That means that it doesn't matter what it looks like in the natural. It doesn't matter what our eyes, what our five senses tell us. It doesn't matter what the doctors say. It doesn't matter what mankind says. It doesn't even matter what our own expectation is. Nothing is impossible with God. 
And then Jesus continued with that in Mark 9, 23. He said, everything is possible for him who believes. You know, we have limits sometimes that we set, known or unknown, on the parameters and the boundaries of what we actually believe. And we don't always comprehend that until we come up to a situation that requires faith beyond what we currently believe. And then we recognize that there's a, there's a gap between what needs to happen and where my faith is. And God wants to expand and deepen our faith. He doesn't want us to continue in the same level of faith. You can know in your head that miracles are for today, that healing is for today. But knowing it in your head isn't going to do anything for you. It's not going to do anything for the person that you, uh, that you pray for because it's faith. It's when we believe and then we receive. And so it's important for us to recognize God calls us to go from faith to faith, from glory to glory. That means that we go from faith to faith. That means there are levels of faith that we can attain to. And as we walk this walk with him, then there are going to be opportunities for our faith to be deepened, our faith to be demonstrated, our faith to be strengthened, and for our faith to grow stronger. If you want to increase your faith, read the words of Jesus. The words of Christ will help build your faith. So if we're in a place where miracles are possible in every aspect, whether it's a physical miracle, a creative miracle, a financial miracle, a relational miracle, a prodigal miracle, whatever kind of miracle is needed, nothing is impossible for God. Nothing. And you know, as we look at the scriptures that that revolve around that concept, it is amazing to me how it causes us to rethink and relook at where does our faith go? How deep does it go? How far does it go? You know, Jesus, he didn't have any doubt when he spoke to the winds and the waves that they were going to cease. I don't think Jesus would waste his breath if he wasn't sure. But when he spoke to the winds and the waves and he said, peace, be still, when he spoke to it, he knew that that faith, that belief that he had, that all things are possible to him who believes, when he spoke it, he knew it would be that the reality would change because of what was spoken. Because it, they weren't empty words. They were words spoken from a heart full of faith. So tonight, as we talk about miracles, we're going to talk about the different ways that miracles can be ministered. Because, you know, operating in the miraculous, it's not a form. It's not like you can just have a formula and go, oh, well, if I do this, 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 and this, then everything's going to, to happen. Well, you know, the Lord doesn't like formulas. Because as soon as we start getting into a formula, then we become more, uh, have more faith in the formula than we do in the God behind the formula. 
And so God likes to throw things into the mix. We see it throughout Scripture that as Jesus walked and as he moved in miracles, he didn't do it the same way every time. In fact, he gave us demonstrations of many ways in which miracles can be ministered. So we're going to talk about some of those today. One of them is through the spoken word. And when I say spoken words, that's when you speak to it. We see in John 5, 8, when Jesus came to the pool of Bethesda, there was a man there that had been there 38 years. We know the story. The man had been there for some time. And when he, um, when he wanted to get into the water because he, they believed that an angel stirred the water, and when he wanted to get into the water, he would say, well, you know, I don't have anybody to help me, and, and by the time I get there, somebody else has already got, gotten in. And Jesus, first of all, he asked him, do you want to be well? <laughs> but he also... When it was time for that miracle to manifest, he said, pick up your mat and walk. Pick up your mat. And when he spoke it, he already knew that man was going to pick up that mat and walk. He knew it. He didn't doubt it. He didn't say, let's see what happens. He spoke and it happened. Now, Jesus did everything that he did. Every miracle that Jesus did, he did as a man. Fully human. Fully God. But fully human. If he did it as God, then we could never hope to do the things that Jesus did. But because he was a man and truly serves as our example of how a person, a son or a daughter, can walk in alignment in righteousness, in right standing with God, having been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, being in perfect relationship with the, our Heavenly Father, how we can operate in miracles just like Jesus did. That's why he said, he who believes in me, the things I do, he will do. If we're just doing what Jesus did, we're still falling short. Because he went on to say, and greater things will they do. Because I go to the Father. The spoken word. We see it again with Paul. It wasn't just Jesus. And Paul was a good example because Paul um, walked in that place of righteousness, that, that relationship with the Lord, and he had been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb in right standing with God, and he understood his authority and his identity. He understood that because of who we are in relationship to the Father, we too can speak and things will happen. Your future is in your mouth. Because what we say carries great weight. And if we can understand and comprehend that and believe, then we will begin to speak and we will see miracles. Paul was in a situation and there was a a uh, man who had been crippled from birth in Acts 14, 8 through 10, says Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. 
Now here's the question. Do you think that that miracle would have happened had Paul not said, stand up on your feet? I don't think so either. The man had faith, but there wasn't that demand put on that faith. But when Paul spoke, whatever needed to happen to make that man's legs, feet, ankles come together and be whole and healed happened in an instant. And Paul said, stand up on your feet. In Psalms 107, 19 through 21, it says, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. When we have a word, when we begin to speak, especially as the Lord lays it on our heart to speak it. All of, of creation, all of, of heaven, all of the Lord backs that up. When he gives us a word, there's power in it. I remember one time, as an example, uh, there was a woman who had come uh, for a service, and, and I had seen her from across the sanctuary. She was there with her husband. She was in a wheelchair, and she had a cast on her leg. And uh, she had come up, and, and some people were praying with her and for her. And at the end of the service, uh, I had walked out to the foyer, and she and her husband were just getting ready to go out of the door. And so I, I said hello to them, greeted them, and just said, you know, how are you doing tonight? And the woman looked at me, and she had tears in her eyes. And she said, and this should break all of our hearts, she said, I just didn't want to leave the same way I came in. And I thought, dear Lord, you know, she, she came with an expectation of meeting you here. And whatever it was for her expectation, she's leaving and feeling disappointed. And so, um, so I asked her, if I could pray for her. And uh, she, of course, said yes. And so I began to pray for her. And when she said that she didn't want to leave the same way she came in, I assumed, which we shouldn't assume, right? Um, but I assumed that she was talking about her physical condition because she was in a wheelchair with this cast, and I'm sure it was painful. And um, so I began to pray for her leg. And as I began to pray, the Holy Spirit just laid it on my heart to decree over her that she would walk in three days. So I did. I spoke to her leg. I commanded it to be healed. I didn't even know what was wrong with it at the, at the time. Commanded it to be healed. And then in three days, you will walk. And then I went and, and uh, after we finished praying, she and her husband were very, very encouraged. They had driven up from Tifton, Georgia, to come to the service and um, she began to explain what was going on with her leg. And what had happened is, and I hope I can remember all the details of it, but basically what had happened is she had a um, situation where uh, she needed to have a bone graft in her leg. And when they did the bone graft, it actually had, had been too short. And uh, it, didn't, it didn't connect, and, and it had separated. There was a gap 
in her bone. And um, she said she was very encouraged because she said that in three days she had an appointment with the surgeon who was going to reassess whether they could go back and do this, redo the surgery. And so, you know, when, when you speak a word like that, you have to, do you have to cover that word in prayer? And so I prayed for her. I asked her, I said, would you please keep us posted? Would you let us know? And then, you know, oh, great woman of faith that I am. It's like, oh, Lord. <laughs> I know that was you, wasn't it? <laughs> Come on, let's be real. You know, when the anointing's there, you can be 100%. But when that cloud moves, it's like, okay, Lord, <laughs> that was you, right? But I did believe it was the Lord. I, I really did. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have said it if I didn't. But, but I began to pray over it. And I, I waited and waited to hear whether or not that she had, uh, if, if that had, uh, that declaration, that decree over her leg had come true. And I didn't hear anything. Nothing from the church office. Nobody called. She had promised she would call. And so I, I really, it, it threw me from the point of just, Lord, did I miss you? Did I, you know, was there something that, what, what am I missing, God? Because I know that was you. And uh, so, week goes by, two weeks goes by, three weeks goes by, nothing. And uh, in the meantime, you know, you beat yourself up sometimes about those kinds of things and say, ah, oh, you know, maybe I just was jumped in too quickly. Right? And the devil's right there going, oh, yeah, you did. <laughs> True that. <laughs> but uh, but I, I knew that it was the Lord. Anyway, to make a long story short, one day I was talking. I called the church for something. And uh, the church secretary goes, oh, by the way, Prophet Catherine, there's a message that's here for you. It's been here for a couple of weeks. And it's from so-and-so. Uh, and she said, tell Prophet Catherine that what she decreed happened. <laughs> and I thought, Lord, you have hid it from me. <laughs> Because what he did was he, during that time, he made me become cemented in my faith about that. In other words, I was so, I, I had, I couldn't be wishy-washy. I couldn't be, well, maybe it was God. Well, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was, either it was or it wasn't. I had to make a decision. And he made me come to that place where, Lord, I don't know what happened, but I know it was you. And I would say it again if the woman was right here in front of me. And when I got to that place, then I got the message. You know, that, it, that she had walked in three days, which would have been a creative miracle. And, you know, that creative miracle of that bone growing because she could not put weight on that leg at that time. So, you know, when you speak a word that's inspired by Holy Spirit, when you speak to something, when you command something to line up, when you command a back and vertebrae to be healed, when you command a hip to go back into place, when you command these things, you have the authority to see it happen. And when Holy Spirit gives you something specific to say, to decree, or to, to do, then, then it's in the bank. All you have to do is believe it. 
to say it and believe it. But that spoken word, we see throughout the Bible many times that people were healed and had miracles take place just simply by the faith of the person that was ministering to them beginning to speak and tell them either a directive or to speak to it, and they were healed. Another way that God ministers miracles is through the laying on of hands. And we are very familiar with that, especially in Pentecostal circles and, and uh, you know, in, in uh, full gospel circles. Uh, the laying on of hands is a very common thing. But we don't need to be reliant on that being the only way. But we do see a number of examples. Uh, one is in Luke 4.40. Uh, Jesus had just healed Peter's mother-in-law from the fever. And it says that in Luke 4.40, while the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases, were brought. they brought them to him. And laying his hands on each one of them, he was healing them. So we see Jesus laying hands on people to release and impart healing. Luke 13, 13. And it talks about the, this is the story of the woman who uh, the scripture says was crippled by a spirit for 18 years. The older woman, uh, widow that was bent over. And uh, she had been crippled for 18 years. And according to Luke 13, 13, it says, And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. There is an impartation when we lay hands on, on people. In fact, the scripture says, that for those who believe, they shall lay hands on the sick and what? They shall recover. Not they might recover. Not, well, if they prayed enough, they'll recover. And if you don't have faith for that person to be healed, then you don't need to be laying hands on them. Right? Right? Because if we're just laying hands for, as a religious practice, that's just religion. We are people of faith, faith in action. And when we believe that when I lay hands on you, you're going to receive healing, I believe it, the word says it's true and I stand on it, then I believe when I lay hands on you, something's going to happen. That's why... When we lay hands on people, we make sure that somebody's behind them. Because I don't know what's going to happen, but I expect something to happen. And so we'll have, uh, you know, people behind catchers and that sort of thing. Because if the power hits, and we are expecting the power to hit. The next way is by a directive by the Holy Spirit. Uh, in Mark 22 through 25, we know the story. It talks about Jesus going to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him. They begged him to touch him. They, oh, they, did, they just wanted Jesus to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand, and he led him out of town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. Now, if you're not familiar with Jewish tradition, you might not, it, it might escape you the significance of what that just said. It said he spit on his eyes. The spittle of a firstborn son was thought to have healing properties in Jewish culture. So if a firstborn son were to spit on something, they believed that there was a supernatural 
um, impartation of healing properties in that spittle, which was a declaration by virtue of him spitting that he was declaring himself the firstborn son. Not of Joseph, but of God. Now, a directive of the Holy Spirit can be, can be concerning sometimes, you know, because Holy Spirit is usually going to give you direction on what needs to happen in order for this person to receive healing. And it's not always going to be in your comfort zone. I mean, think about it. You know, when Jesus went and, and he, he was praying for this blind man, it says he got some dirt, and then he spit in the dirt, right? And then he came and put it on his eyes. Well, you know that man had to be blind. <laughs> I mean, if you saw somebody pick up some dirt and spit in it and go, here, and to start to put it in your eyes, you know he was blind, right? That, that was not a usual way of healing. That was not the typical way in which uh, Jesus prayed for people or that we see the disciples. In fact, I don't recall any other example where a disciple spit and put their hands on people's eyes or any other part for that matter. I remember how many of you I, I, I won't say his name, but you probably would know who I'm talking about. He's a very well-known um, prophet, specializes, tends to have a very keen uh, sense of timing. And uh, one time he was <laughs> telling me this story about how... Um, this woman who was an intercessor in his ministry had been an intercessor with his ministry for 10 years. And one day she called him up on the phone and she said, Prophet, um, my husband has prostate cancer, stage four. And we're going to uh, take him to MD Anderson, the cancer hospital in Texas. We're going to be taking him to MD Anderson to get some scans and also to evaluate for surgery and, you know, oncology and the process for, uh, you know, getting rid of this cancer. And we're going to be coming through uh, your town and we were wondering, I was wondering if you were going to be at your church that Sunday because I, I was going to ask you if you could pray for my husband. So he said, well, absolutely. He had never met her husband on all the years she'd been an intercessor with his ministry. But he said, I would love to meet your husband, and I will be in town. I'll be at church. And so please come by that Sunday, and at the end of service, you know, come down to the front. And I'll be happy to pray for him. So... Um, at this particular church, they are very lively in their praise and worship. They are very demonstrative in their, the way they adore the Lord. They dance, they sing, they have banners, they do, you know, I mean, they're, whatever the Holy Spirit is doing, they're right in the middle of it. So if you are a conservative uh, religious person, it might feel a little disconcerting if you're not used to it. Right? So, this woman's husband was of the Nazarene faith and uh, went to the church of the Nazarene. And so, uh, the prophet was at, it was at the end of the service and he saw the woman coming down the aisle with her husband and he looked very uncomfortable. He had on a suit and a tie and he's all, you know, dressed up and everybody else is kind of casual and in jeans and that sort of thing. 
And this guy comes up, and she's kind of dragging him, and she's talking. She's saying, oh, I'm so glad you finally get to meet him. I've been telling him about you for years, and da-da-da-da-da. And she says, and this is, this is prophet, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I've been part of his ministry for years. And, and so... The prophet's listening, and he's watching, and, he's, and all of a sudden, Holy Spirit starts talking to him. And he said, when you go to pray for him, I want you to get down on your knees and yell at the top of your lungs into his prostate and command the cancer to go. And the man was already uncomfortable. <laughs> and so he's listening to what Holy Spirit is saying. And the man finally extended his hand after the woman had given the introduction. His wife had given the introduction. He's going, well, you know, it is so nice to finally meet you. And this prophet, he's going, yeah, nice to meet you too. He goes, well, I really appreciate you praying for me. He goes, I'm looking forward to it, <laughs> right? And he said that as soon as the man's hand dropped, he, in obedience, he dropped to his knees and yelled at the top of his lungs right into the man's prostate and began to say, in the name of Jesus, I command cancer to go now in Jesus' name. And the man was like just <laughs> in shock. He's just kind of falling back. And the prophet gets up. He goes, very nice to meet you. And he walks out the back door. <laughs> he said that four days later, they called him from MD Anderson. There was not a cell of cancer in that man's body. Now, was that comfortable for him to do it? No. In fact, all, all signs would say that this not, is not the man to do that to, right? I mean, you know, he might turn around and run out of the building or forbid his wife to ever be a part of anything else that they do. But the Holy Spirit knew the strategy that was, that was necessary to unlock the enemy's hold and to command the enemy to loosen. And when obedience and faith is mixed with the directive of the Holy Spirit, miracles happen. And so we have to be willing to do what it is that the Holy Spirit shows us to do. Now, don't be getting on your knees, okay, and yelling at people, all right? I mean, unless God says specifically. But in other words, that's not a form. But if the Holy Spirit shows you to pray a certain way or handle something a certain way, or sometimes people will come up and they'll want to um, have a prayer for an illness, and God's telling you that the root, the spiritual root of it is self-hate. Do you hear what I'm saying? And he's saying, I want you to break self-hate off of them. And, and you see, that may seem totally different and contrary to what they're even asking for. But if that's what the Holy Spirit is saying, this will unlock their miracle. Then we want to be obedient and do whatever it is the Holy Spirit says. Amen? So a directive of the Holy Spirit. Another way that God does miracles is when they would reach out to touch him. In um, Mark 6, 55 and 60, 56, um, Jesus had just walked out to the boat um, 
you know, when the, the disciples were out and they had left in the boat and then he came behind walking on the water. He'd just come into the boat and then they landed. And the people recognized Jesus when he came into the region. It says they ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. And in, Mark, in Matthew 14, 35 through 46, it says, And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent out and uh, throughout the surrounding region, it's, it sounds like a replay, brought to him all who were sick and begged that they might touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched it were made perfectly well. Matthew 9, 20, we know the story of the woman with the issue of blood. She... Uh, came, had been bleeding for 12 years. She had been suffering under the, the auspices of a number of different doctors, but many physician treatments. Nothing had worked. She had this issue of blood. She said, if only I can touch the hem of his garment. And she did, and he felt virtue go out of him. And she was healed. So reaching out to touch him. Now, today, when we reach out to touch the Lord, it's in praise and worship. We lift up holy hands. We lift up hands to worship him. It's like we're reaching to him. Lord, I just want to touch your, the hem of your garment. I just want to be near you. I just want to be with you. And as we praise and worship many get healed during praise and worship you know when we're in that place it's almost like just reaching out to touch the hem of his garment so praise and worship is another way in which we can uh he can minister miracles another way is the name the name of Jesus, Mark 16, 17 through 18. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. You know, you can go up to a demon and say, get out, in the, you know, and not use Jesus' name. And they'll go, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Right? It's in that name that is more powerful. There is nothing greater than the name of Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus. So in his name, we can uh, release miracles. Another way is using anointing oil. We see in James 5, 14 and 15, it says, Is any of you sick? He should call for the elders of the church to pray and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. And if he is sinned, he will be forgiven. So anointing oil. Um, when we have our teams, we often have anointing oil uh, available uh, because many times Holy Spirit will say, anoint them with oil. And when he does, we do. And you should too when you're praying for people. And then there's the prayer of faith. You can do this on your own, actually. Um, Mark eleven twenty three says, Truly I say to you that whoever shall say to this mountain, Be you removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. 
Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. I don't think that we have yet comprehended the power of faith to the degree that the Lord wants us to comprehend it. Because if we could speak to a mountain and believe that it would be cast into the sea if we spoke to it to do so, can you imagine the level of faith that we would be walking in? But at the same time, we've got to be, have it be mature. You can't just be throwing mountains around. <laughs> you know, I got to get to work. Mountain, get out of my way, <laughs> right? That, that doesn't work. You could totally redo the geography. But think about that. He said, if you say that to a mountain, and don't doubt in your heart that what you say will be. That it will happen. And that is, that is a level of understanding of faith and walking in faith and demonstrating faith that we are aspiring to. And that all of us should be seeking to attain, to have that kind of faith. To where when we say, he will live and not die. And believe in our heart that what we say will be. Because God has laid it in our heart that it should be. That it would be. And because we believe it. And we trust him. When we speak it. It will happen. So the prayer of faith. Now that also applies to you praying for yourself. How many of you have ever laid hands on yourself? That you know, we're we're Christians, we do that kind of thing. World doesn't understand that. But I think if you if you if you have faith and you believe and you lay hands and you begin to pray, I mean I've had it to where I've had to sit down, I'm gonna go out. <laughs> lay hands on yourself and you go out. But, but it can happen. And, you know, but you can have that level of faith and use it as you pray for yourself. Another way in which miracles are ministered is through the power of the anointing. In Luke 5.17, it's talking about Jesus, and it says... Uh, one day he was teaching Pharisees and teacher of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And they were sitting there. And it says, and the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. And as that scripture goes on, it talks about the friends that brought the paralyzed man and lowered him through the roof. But the power of the Lord was present to heal the sick. Now, sometimes you may just get an, an inclination, you may get a revelation that God wants to heal. Many times we'll see this in a service where whoever's leading the service or the pastor will say, I believe that God wants to heal. If you're, if you're sick, you come up to the front now, right? And it's because they're discerning that the power of the Lord is present to heal. And it just like the bull of Bethesda, when, when that is present, we want to get into it. Right? We want to avail ourselves of it. If we need healing and the leader has identified that the power of the Lord is present to heal, then, 
you know, if you need healing, I would go up front or whatever that directive is that that leader gives at that time. The next, another way that the Lord heals is during communion. In Matthew 26, 26 through 28, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he gave the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for the remission of sins. You know, Communion is the great exchange. You know, when Jesus gave his body, it was broken that yours might be healed. His blood was shed so that your sins and your iniquities could be forgiven. But his body was broken so that your body could be healed. So when we receive communion and have that revelation, God, your body was broken that mine might be healed. When I take that bread as a representation, I am taking in the fullness of his resurrection body. That was, that is the healing power of Jesus Christ. And so many can be healed during communion. And we have seen that before. Many times. Another way in which um, miracles are manifested are through a point of contact. We see in Acts 19, 11, and 12... Uh, it says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Now, I believe that there is the ability to have impartation in that way. But Paul and Peter, they, they were so filled with the Spirit. They were so overflowing in their relationship with Holy Spirit that it was like Holy Spirit was just all around them. You know, so that when anything came in contact with Peter, Paul, or some of the other apostles, that, that it, there was an impartation of that power, of that grace, of that strength. To where when demons would come into contact with it, they would say, I don't want anything to do with this. I'm out of here. And they would leave the person uh, because of a little handkerchief or a little apron that had been brought that had touched that believer. Do you realize that we can have such a relationship with Holy Spirit that he just overshadows us? That when others come into the presence and come into that, that area of the boundaries of our relationship with him that they cannot help but be healed because we are more led by the Spirit than we are by our carnal and natural selves. When we give him that position in us, when we, when we uh, aspire to say, Lord, I want you to overflow. I want those rivers of living water to flow out of me. 
then when those rivers begin to flow, the, the spirit begins to move. When people come into your presence, they, they can't help but be touched, to be healed, where demons begin to manifest because they, they don't want to be anywhere in the vicinity of where you are. They don't want to have anything to do with you because your relationship with him is so great that the Holy Spirit just, just, just overshadows and overtakes anything else that would try. Darkness cannot survive in that atmosphere. And it comes from walking in holiness. It comes from relationship with him. It comes with making a commitment and saying, God, you are the most important thing to me. I want you in my life above all else. I want you to be glorified above everything else. It's not about me. It's about you. And when you take that posture in your heart, Holy Spirit loves to come and be a part and co-labor with you to advance God's kingdom. Catherine Kuhlman had that kind of relationship with the Lord. They, they said that, that her relationship was so close with the Holy Spirit that it was almost like he attended her. People would come into the vicinity of, of her presence because Holy Spirit was so strong. I mean, they would just fall out. But it came with a price. And that price was, she said, there was a day, and I won't go into her whole story, but it's a, an incredible story of faith. If you ever want to read her story, there's a book by Jamie Buckingham called Daughter of Destiny, and it's her, her, her story, and it's, it's really inspiring. But she reached a point where she was on the street one day. She had lost everything. She said, God, I have nothing to give you. Nothing. There is nothing I have. There is nothing that is worth what you deserve. But if you can use me. If you, can, if you can use me, God, I am yours 100%. I belong to you. And things began to change because she died to self and truly sought that relationship with him. And it is a dying process. The last way we're going to talk about tonight is, is very similar to the point of contact. And that's the shadow or presence of the Holy Spirit through an individual. We see that in Acts 5, 15, and 16, talking about Peter. And it said, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. Peter went through a dying process. He had to come to the end of himself. And when he denied the Lord, I believe that that is where his heart broke. And he realized, Lord, 
I am imperfect. I am broken. I am not in and of myself. I have nothing to, to offer except my hands, my heart, all that I am, I give to you. And when we come into that place of relationship with him and that place of surrender and trust, Bill Johnson, who's a minister out on the West Coast, he asks the question oftentimes. He'll say, if what God has for your life was on a blank page and you had no idea what he had in store for you, would you still sign your name at the bottom of the page? If you had no idea what he had in store, would you sign your name? That's trust. Trusting that whatever you have for me is greater than anything I can imagine for myself because you're good and you know me better than anyone. You know my gifts, you created them. I have nothing to give except what you gave me and all that I have I give back to you. When you come to that place, miracles can't help but begin to manifest. Because then it's not about you and what you need or what you want or what you think. It's all about him. It's about his love for that person you're praying for. It's about his glory being given his, all the miracle and healing, giving him glory. You just have the privilege of being a participator. Miracles are for now. There is nothing that is holding it back except for our willingness to step into it. And believe. God's not looking for Christians. He's looking for believers. And if we believe what he said is true. Then we won't hesitate. To pray and believe for miracles to happen, to pray and believe for creative miracles, financial miracles, whatever kind of miracle it is, we won't hesitate because we know the God who created all of it. He wants to use you. He wants to use me. He wants to use all of us. And he's breaking out in miracles, in places where people are saying, God, use me. Here are my hands. Here's my mouth. Use me, God, and I'll pray and I'll believe. And miracles are breaking out. How many of you want to be a miracle worker for God? I do too. I want to pray for you and then we're going to do an activation and pray for each other. Because that is the way that it should be. Is that what you have is needed by your brother, your sister, whoever 
is around you, if they need healing, if they need a financial miracle, if they need, uh, you know, a relationship miracle, if they need a job miracle, whatever kind of miracle it is that they need, our God is here ready to meet them. Do you believe that? Yes, let's give him some praise for that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. All right, I want you to just hold your hands up right now. Father, I thank you that you are the God of miracles. You are the God who brings miracles to manifest in the natural realm. But, Father, you use us. So today... We come and we ask you, Lord, to forgive us for our complacency, forgive us for our doubt, forgive us for our unbelief, forgive us when we have not acted when we should have or when we acted out of presumption. Father, just forgive us. Forgive us for every sin, Lord. We ask you to cleanse us by that blood that was shed by Jesus. And Lord, we commit our lives to you. All that I have, Father, all that we have, we give into your hands. And we say, have your way. Use us, Lord. Teach us that we might be good stewards of the manifold grace that you have given. We ask for miracles. We ask for breakthroughs. We ask for creative miracles. We ask for families and marriages restored. We ask for prodigals to come home. We ask, God, that you would do great deliverances that you would uproot generational iniquities. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would move through this sanctuary and move through the homes of every person that is watching and begin to drive out all demonic influence. Sweep through Lord, we open our hearts, we open our eyes, we open our ears, and we say, use us, Lord, and we will be faithful. In Jesus' name. Now, if you believe that, I want to hear a very loud amen. amen. Woo! Thank you, Lord. <laughs>